Thank you, Daron, and thank you to all the folks in the National Library of Israel for all of the wonderful programming and content you guys have been doing over, over Corona, and uh, hopefully now we'll all come out of Corona and you'll continue to uh, present these offerings to people all around the world, and thank you all for joining us. Um, please, if you're interested, uh, let us know in the chat where you're joining us from so we can see. I see already we have from uh, Finland and uh, Canada and America and, of course, here here in uh, in Israel. Tonight in Israel and, and around the world, we are on the eve of the holiday of Sukkot, what in English is sometimes called Tabernacles, uh, a festival, a very beloved festival uh, throughout the Jewish world in which we build these kind of little huts outdoors and we uh, take all of our meals, uh, particularly here in Israel, the weather is very warm. Our, some of our ancestors in uh, Poland or Russia would suffer to go out sometimes this time of year that ought to be snow on the ground. But here in Israel, the weather is, is quite mild and, and pleasant. And we go outside and enjoy time with family in the, in the sukkah, in this kind of uh, hut covered by uh, natural greenery. And it's a way that we remember God's protection of the Jewish people after the exodus during the 40 years of wandering in the in the desert. And one of the commandments of, of uh, Sukkot is to take the four special species, uh, a palm frond, a myrtle, a willow leaf, and an etrog, or in English, a citron, a kind of, a kind of Mediterranean fruit that looks a lot like uh, a lemon. And these four species, the, what colloquially in Hebrew is called the lulav and etrog, are taken, are held, are shaked and waved as part of the, part of the service, the prayer service, during the seven days of the Sukkot holiday. Our great author, Hebrew literature's only Nobel laureate, S.Y. Agnon, Shai Agnon, wrote very many wonderful tales about the Jewish holidays and Sukkot amongst them. And this evening, we'll look at some of them and we'll hearken back to the roots from which he's drawn, from the well from which he draws. And we'll also try to look forward to see how his stories have influenced other, uh, uh, other artifacts of Jewish uh, life and Israeli life and literature and culture uh, going forward through the prism of his telling of these stories. S.Y. Agnon uh, received the Nobel literature, the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1966, the first Israeli to win the Nobel Prize in any category. We've since gone on to win many, of course, in the sciences and in the economics, and even three peace prizes for peace, which is a little ironic as that's the the real achievement that we haven't yet fully achieved, but we've been awarded for it, or at least for our efforts, uh, nevertheless. Uh, Agdon uh, is, again, the only Hebrew author, although many Jewish authors, even some writing in very distinctly Jewish registers, have received the Nobel Prize for writing in, in English, such as Sol Bellow, for writing in Yiddish, such as Isaac Abashevis Singer. But Agnon occupies a particularly important place here in Israel, in Hebrew letters in general, and in Jewish life and literature and culture at, at large. I'm Rabbi Jeffrey Sachs. I'm the director of research at the, at the Agnon House. That's my email address uh, there on the, on, the, on the screen. You're welcome to you're welcome to um, to chat with me afterwards or to get in touch with me after the after the event. I've also just now in the chat posted a variety of different links to things I'll be mentioning over the night, and you're welcome afterwards to look at them or to download them or to print them out. They make might make for nice reading over the holiday in your own sukkah or around your own family family uh, table. Agnon. Uh, had the great good fortune in the person of his patron, Shlomo Zalman Shokin of the Shokin Publishing House and later of the Haaretz newspaper, still an extremely influential newspaper here, here in Israel and through its English edition around the world. Uh, Agnon met Shokin uh, early in middle age and Shokin became his patron. Uh, he received a salary, a stipend from Shokin that allowed him to dedicate himself throughout, you know, his mid-age, well into old age, fully to his 
to his craft uh, of, of writing. I don't know any author or poet or artist who would give up such a sweetheart deal, but uh, I don't know any who in time wouldn't come to resent it. Because, you know, for artists, the muse comes when, when she comes, not when Mr. Shokin calls. But part of the arrangement uh, with, uh, with Shokin was that Agnon had to produce material. He had to produce books. He was meant to produce a new Hebrew book or anthology of stories around every other year. And he was supposed to produce a certain amount of content that would appear in the newspapers, particularly in advance of the holidays. People would buy the newspaper on the eve of the holiday and the newspaper would have the special literary supplement, a kind of weekend magazine uh, in advance of the holiday. And all of the readers were expecting there would be a new Agnon story there. Very many of Agnon's holiday themed short stories were written and published and timed to appear in the newspaper in advance of the different holidays. And that is the case with the two short stories we'll see tonight. The first one is called in English, That Tzadik's et Rog, et Rogo Shel Oto Tzadik. In Hebrew, it appears in the volume Ha'esh Sim. In English, it appears in this uh, anthology called A Book That Was Lost. Uh, by the Toby Press, uh, a project with which I was uh, affiliated in putting out 15 volumes of Agnon's uh, stories in English translation with annotations and commentary. In the links that I posted, you can find the whole catalog of, his, of these, these books in English. And this appears in a, a volume called A Book That Was Lost, a collection of 35 stories by Toby Press. This story, what you see on the screen, is, is Agnon's actual etrog box. That's not his etrog, but a, a, a replica that we created or posed for the purposes of the photograph. But that is, in fact, Agnon's own silver etrog box that if you come and visit us in the Agnon house, you can see on, you can see on display. And this is a story that was published on the eve of Sukkot, 1948. Now, students of history will know there were other things going on in this country in 1948. Uh, but nevertheless, the newspaper was still published, literature was still being written, and people were still were still reading there in the throes of the events, the greater events of 1948. The story begins like this. The naive reader might think this is nothing more than a retelling of a pious Hasidic tale. Very many of Agnon's stories present themselves in that guise. Anyone who reads Agnon's stories of the old world, of course, he wrote in many genres. He wrote in surrealistic, modernistic uh, uh, type stories, stories for which he was compared to Kafka, a comparison that he bristled at. He wrote long modern novels, but he did, of course, write many stories of the old world of the shtetl, readers uh, who are image poor, the file in your hard drive up here. Uh, it doesn't have too many images of it. And you read Agnon, and sometimes you call up images that you maybe have seen in Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, that's a mistake for reasons I've discussed on other occasions we don't have time to go into now, but it's not a terribly far mistake. Right? To think of the old world, the shtetl of Eastern Europe, even though Agnon wasn't part of the Russian Pale of Jewish Settlement, he lived in Galicia, which was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's a whole different story. And those of you that are interested can find uh, my writings or online lectures, and of course, those of others who describe the whole milieu of Agnon's, of Agnon's world. But we're talking about the world of Eastern European Jewry, the world which, of course, was tragically destroyed in in the Holocaust. If you read Agnon's stories of that world and think all they are are retellings of pious Hasidic tales, you're not reading properly. You're not reading between the lines. You're misunderstanding how in the transformation at his pen, the stories become modern stories. Hasidic tales are almost always didactic in one form or another. If we were in a more intimate setting, instead of 162 people on Zoom with their microphones closed off, I might ask you to suggest, those of you that know, give me Hasidic Tale 101. What's a classic example of a Hasidic tale? And no doubt 
somebody would offer up the suggestion of that old, that old chestnut about the little boy who didn't know how to pray and he had a whistle or a little flute and his father brought him to the synagogue and perhaps it was the synagogue of the Baal Shem Tov himself, the 18th century founder of Hasidism. And perhaps it was none other than the holy day of Rosh Hashanah, which we just you know, celebrated a week and a half ago. And while all of the Hasidim, the holy men were praying fervently to God, this little boy who didn't know how to read and he didn't know, he didn't know the, the prayers takes out his flute and he starts blowing and the Hasidim of course go wild. They're ready to tear him limb from limb for disturbing the prayers. And not only that, uh, according to Jewish uh, custom and law, we don't play musical instruments on the Sabbath and, and on the, on the holy days. And the Baal Shem Tov says to his, to his disciples, no, don't you understand? Only this little boy's prayer is sincere. Only this little boy's prayer offered through his whistle is accepted in heaven because it's offered with a pure heart. And another version of the story, the little boy, the little boy, uh, instead of blowing a whistle, starts screaming out the Aleph bet, the Jewish alphabet. Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Bob, Zayin, Ches, You people think he's crazy. What is he doing? He's 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 not normal. And the little boy says, "Well, I don't know how to read, so I can't make sense of the prayer book. But I, all I know is the is the alphabet. So I scream out the alphabet." And I throw the letters up to heaven and God himself knows how to arrange them into the prayers. And the Baal Shem Tov says, oh, only his prayer is sincere. Only his prayer is offered with a pure heart. Only his prayer is accepted. You don't need to be a literary scholar or a great learned rabbi to decipher the meaning of these stories. In the first one, the one with the flute, it, which might actually be the more original layer of the story, it makes sense, of course, that the story is taking place on none other than Rosh Hashanah. And the flute, of course, becomes symbolic of the sincerity of the prayer of the shofar, the ram's horn on which we, which we blow on, on Rosh Hashanah. These were simple stories that the Rebbe could tell over at Shalashudis, at the third meal on on a Sabbath afternoon, and the simplest water drawer and wood chopper and shoemaker immediately understood. One did not need the the the, the rhetorical uh, uh, Gemara cup in order to make sense or meaning of these of these stories because the meaning was so clearly embedded. When Agnon takes a story, a Hasidic tale, it undergoes a transformation at his pen. And reading one of his stories, one is meant to make sense of that. But opening the story and closing the story were given the testimony of transmission. How does the narrator of this story in 1948 know this tale that took place 200 years earlier? So we have the record of transmission so that we, the reader, know that the story that's being told to us is authentic. The great Israeli uh, author and literary critic Samech Yizhar commented that this very short story, the story itself is only a couple of hundred words, is, is uh, bound together like one of those ancient books with the large, heavy, perhaps wooden engraved covers you would see a book like that without even opening it, without even knowing what was written on the pages inside, to know that a book was bound together between such impressive weighty covers told you that the content must be significant. And these two testimonies of transmission, that bracket that frame the story are meant to give it weight. This is how the story begins. You heard the story from whomever you may have heard it, whereas I heard it from a chassid, the son of a chassid, who heard it from his teacher, Reb Shlomo, the tzaddik of Zhvil, the direct seventh generation descendant of Rav Michle, the holy preacher, the Magid of Zlacho. And there is no question that the way I heard it, says the narrator, from that chassid who heard it from his Rebbe is exactly the way it happened. Since that righteous Reb Shlomo of Zhvil had it from his father's and in the very language of his father's, he told it, not adding a word except for clarification. So whatever he added was the very stuff 
of the original. So we know that this story is authentic because the person about whom the story concerns itself, this Reb Michle, the holy preacher, the Magad of Zlotchov, who was a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, we have a direct chain of transmission from then to us in 1948. And here's that chain. There's Reb Yechiel Michel, the Reb Michle of the story, who was a historical character. This was a real live historical character, one of the great figures of the of the first generation of the disciples of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidut, who lived in the 18th century. And then there are five or seven generations between him and his descendant, Rabbi Shlomo Goldman, the Tzaddik of Zhvil, who died in 1945. There was a Hasid, the son of a Hasid, who heard the story from Rabbi Shlomo, who who then told it to the narrator. The narrator, maybe the narrator is Agnon himself. Maybe the narrator is someone, let's call him Agnon for the sake of simplicity. And Agnon tells us the story in 1948. Now this Reb Shlomo, the Tzaddik of Zhvil, who's going to come back in another story, he was also an actual character who lived in Yerushalayim, who came on Aliyah in 1926 and died in 1945, just three years before this story was, was published. He was an actual character. He was a Hasidic rabbi of the community of Zhvil, and he came with his Hasidim in the 20s and set up his Hasidic court in Jerusalem. And to this day, on the edge of the neighborhood of Mea Sha'arim, there is still the center, the headquarters of Zhvil Hasidut, and it's headed, I believe, by his, by his grandson. Reb Michle, the holy preacher, oops, uh, he started out as a pauper in a house devoid of material goods. Often he had nothing except the slice he had stashed away in the hat on his head for a beggar, so that in case a beggar should happen along, he would not leave humiliated. For so devoted was that righteous man to his maker that he neglected his own needs, paying attention only to the needs of the Shekhinah, to the divine presence, that is Torah, prayer, and good deeds. This Rav Michle, he was as poor as a mouse. He had nothing, but you know what he had? He had a slice of bread. And he used to keep that slice of bread, seems strange to us, he used to keep it under his hat. I guess if the slice of bread is under your hat, you'll be less tempted to eat it yourself. You know, if you're starving, sometimes it's hard to, hard to hold back. But somebody who has nothing but one slice of bread and saves it in order to provide it to somebody else who's starving, well, then he's really not so poor. Now, no matter how poor you are, if you're able to help someone who's worse off than you, then you're not in a bad position. After all, doesn't Solomon tell us in the Proverbs in Sefer Mishlei, that the righteous man understands the soul of his beast. I'm going to come back to that momentarily. That's a verse in the book of Proverbs. Well, so too, the wife of that righteous man understood the soul of her righteous husband. She did all she could to keep aggravation away from him and to protect him against all distractions from his holy work, unlike <laughs> most women who, when the cupboard is bare, come uh, muttering and nattering. Now, that seems like a rather misogynistic thing to say, Except we'll see by the time the story is over, it's said here quite ironically, because Reb Shlomo, Reb Michle is called the Tzaddik. Now, a Tzaddik in the translators of this story didn't translate the word Tzaddik. They left it in the title of the story, that Tzaddik's et rog. Tzaddik literally means a righteous person. A person who does righteous things can lay claim to the title of Tzaddik. But Tzaddik with a capital TZ is a title as well. It means a Hasidic rabbi who leads a group of Hasidim, who has followers, who is what we call sometimes a Rebbe, right? A Rebbe is not the same as a rabbi. A Rebbe is someone who offers support, who offers succor, who offers encouragement, who helps lift up the downtrodden, who gathers his beloved Hasidim around himself, offering warmth and encouragement and teaching and preaching. So 
this Rav Michle was a tzaddik. Well, he was a righteous man, simply understood in the, in the, in the colloquial sense, but he was a tzaddik. It was a title. He was the head of a Hasidic group. But this verse in Proverbs that says, Yodeya tzaddik nefesh behem to. So a verse in the book of Proverbs, chapter 12, verse 10, a righteous man, a tzaddik, knows or understands the soul of his beast. You know, I mean, maybe you have animals. We, we, we have kids, so we've had a lot of, I mean, not my children. I mean, we have, our kids have always had a lot of pets, cats and dogs and turtles and hamsters and birds and fish and uh, mice. And uh, uh, I'm probably forgetting some. Snake, I drew the line at snake. So one of the things about like having pets is, you know, the pets can't tell you what they need. And if you're a good, if you're a good pet owner, you have to learn to intuit the needs of your, of your animal. When the animal is happy, when the animal is sad, when the animal is hungry, when the animal wants to go out for a walk, when it needs to have its cage chain, whatever it is. So it's a mark of righteousness. You know, in the days of old, of course, uh, people didn't keep pets. Right, Hasidim in Europe didn't keep pets, but there were a lot of household animals around. The cat was not a pet. The cat was a mousetrap. The goat was not a pet. The goat was was the the dairy cupboard. Right, it provided milk, and when it was done providing milk, maybe it also provided meat. The chicken uh, provided eggs. People lived in proximity to to animals, and having animals means you have a responsibility to care for them. So. Solomon says in Mishle, in Proverbs, that a tzar, righteous person, will intuit the needs of his animals. Rashi comments, not just his animals, but the members of his household. That's part of being the head of a family, right? Is to know what your children need, to know what your spouse needs, to know without having to be told, you know, what's going to make them happy. So yodeya tzadik nefesh behem to, someone who has this quality, of intuiting, of intuiting the needs of the other, that's the mark of a tzaddik. So we know who's the tzaddik in the story. It's right there in the title. Rav Michle is the tzaddik. And not only that, if he had a business card, or if he had to kind of fill out the census and, and write down what is his occupation, he would write, tzaddik, he is the righteous head of a Hasidic sect. But by the story's end, we'll have to ask, who's the true tzaddik in the story? Who exhibits the quality of righteousness as indicated by Shlomo? That a righteous person intuitively understands the needs of the animals and members of his, of his household. One year, it was almost sukkahs, and the rabbi's wife didn't even have a morsel in the house for celebrating the holiday. She thought, I'll go tell my husband, he'll hear and know my distress. She went to his solitude room where he sat and thought. She stood in the doorway and said, Sukkot Eve is upon us. It's, it's a few hours, it's the holiday. We don't have, any, we don't have anything, the, the cupboard is bare. What are we going to feed the children? How are we going to celebrate the holiday? That righteous man lifted himself from his chair, poked his head out from under his talit, put his hand on his tefillin. In the days of old, righteous people, holy people, would wear talit and tefillin all day long, not just as part of the prayer service. He put his hand on his tefillin, the, the phylacteries, the prayer boxes uh, that we wear, and he said to her, you're worried about meat and fish, and I'm worried about not yet having my etrog. Now, the etrog, this yellow citron fruit, if you live in, in Galicia or in Poland, was hard to come by. They had to be imported from from Greece or from Turkey or from Italy or from the land of Israel. And even today, it's a pricey item uh, uh, to get. How is he going to get an etrog for, for fulfilling the mitzvah of, of the lulav and etrog? That righteous man stood up and went all over the house looking for something to sell to use the money to buy an etrog. He looked and didn't find a single thing because he's poor, he's got nothing. And then he fondled his tefillin. Tefillin are a pricey item. You know, a, a basic pair of tefillin today can run you about $500. Tefillin are, are a pricey item, there's no doubt. So what does he do? He goes into the study hall and he says to the Hasidim, is there anyone who'd be interested in buying my 
tefillin. So I mean, who wouldn't want to own the tefillin of of the of the Rebbe? So someone pays him a, a whole gold dinar. I don't know how much that's worth, but it's a lot of money. He takes the gold dinar to the market and he buys an etrog for this gold dinar. Well, his wife, the Rebetzin, heard that her husband had been to the market. She went into his room. She saw the glow on his face and the ecstasy emanating from his entire being. The Rebetzin thought he had brought home all of the festival victuals. She said to him, I see that you are happy. You must have brought us all of the festival provisions. Give them to me and I will prepare them for it. It is nearly time. The righteous man rose from his chair and put his hand on his eyes and said, praise be the blessed and sublime name. Praise be God for bestowing his grace and fulfilling my every need. The Rebetzin stood there waiting for her husband to deliver up the goods, the chicken and meat and fish and challah, whatever they need for, for the holiday. He sat back down in his chair and told her that he'd been privileged to acquire a kosher etrog. Here's a, here's an etrog, right? Like I told you, it looks, it looks a lot like, it looks a lot like a, like a lemon. She asked him, how did you have money to get an etrog? So he told her he sold his tefillin for a gold dinar and he bought, so she said, fine. So gold dinar is a lot of money. Give me the change and I'll run and I'll go and I'll get the food that we need. He says, he says, there was no change. Right? He's, he's rather a uh, tamim. He's rather simple or, or naive. Right? He, he spent a lot of money on this, on this etrog. The Rebetzin swallowed her tears and said, I want to see this great find of yours. The righteous man took out the etrog and unwrapped it. It radiated its beauty and emitted its fragrance. A feast for the eyes and truly fit for the benediction, for the blessing that we recite upon it. Now, this is one of Agnon's very, very many intertextual midrashic weavings into his story. The Hebrew reader, and perhaps even the English reader familiar with the Hebrew Bible, will pick up the reference. A feast for the eyes is a reference to the very first reference to a significant fruit in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve and the fruit, the fruit being very often depicted as an apple. But of course, in the Hebrew Bible, nowhere is it referred to as, as such. That's a medieval Christian interpretation that we're talking about Adam and Eve and the snake and the apple. But in fact, in the Hebrew Bible, it says the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, ta'avahu le'enayim, the exact same phrase that, that Reb Michle had used in the Agnon story. V'nechmad ha'etz l'haskil, the tree was desirable to make one wise. So Eve takes the fruit and she eats it and she gives it all stir her husband with her and he ate. The midrash, the rabbinic interpretation on this passage uh, indicates that, you know, it's like a perfect example of the midrashic imagination at work. Uh, the biblical text does not tell us what fruit this is. This is a pretty significant uh, piece of fruit, right? The downfall of man is, is caught up with this particular piece of fruit. You'd think the Bible would go to the trouble to tell us what kind of fruit it is, but it's absent. So the midrashic rabbinic imagination, uh, despising a vacuum, jumps in and provides many different interpretations. One famous interpretation, that of Rabbi Abba of Akko, says that this fruit of the tree in Eden was an etrog. I mean, there might be reasons for that, but we don't have time to, to, go, to go into that. So in the book of Genesis, a fruit is used by a woman to cause the downfall of her husband. A woman, the wife, sins with the fruit. In our story, you'll see it's not so simple. The woman said, give it to me so I can have a good look at it. She reached out and picked up the etrog. She thought of the pitiful state of her house and the distress of her children who had nothing to eat and how the festival of Sukkot was nearly here. And she had nothing with which to make it festive. Grief drove the strength from her hands. 
and the etrogs slipped and fell. And having fallen, its stem broke. This is a mistranslation. It, it should say this little spitz, this little point, the tip. This is the stem where the tree is, where the fruit is attached to the tree. At the other end is what we call in Hebrew the pitam, or the, the, the nipple of the fruit, which if it becomes blemished, if it becomes dented, if it, be, if it, if it gets damaged, it renders the fruit ritually unfit for use in this particular mitzvah. Having fallen, it broke. And having broken, the etrog was no longer fit for ritual use. The righteous man saw that his etrog was no longer fit for the benediction. He stretched out his two holy hands in despair and said, Tfilin I have not, and etrog I have not, all I have left is anger, but I will not be angry. But I will not be angry. Because despite his shortcomings, despite his flaws, despite his blindness to the circumstances around him, right, he ultimately masters himself. And by not getting angry, he redeems himself. You see, interestingly, this story, Agnon didn't invent the kernel of this story. This is a story that exists in different iterations in the Hasidic tales. Because the Hasidic tales were originally transmitted orally, it's not surprising that there are many different variations on the same story. Like the case I mentioned earlier of the little boy, in one version of the story, he's whistling. In the other version, he's shouting out the, the alphabet. There are at least seven different varieties of this story, very many of them uh, concerning this Rav Michle, the Magid of Zlochov, but some of the stories connected to other Hasidic figures. In some of the stories, the wife is so, is so angry that she throws the etrog, causing damage to it. In others, she's, she's starving to death, and she takes a bite out of it, rendering it unfit for the, for the ritual. In our story, it's so much more subtle. You understand that subtlety is a mark of a modern piece of modern literature. Grief drove the strength from her. These are all passive verbs here. Grief drove the strength from her hand. The etrog slipped and fell. She didn't drop it. It slipped and fell of its own accord almost. Right. In other words, the narration is framed in such a way as to, as to make the whole experience so much more passive, right? To take the blame away from her, because we know ultimately who is the tzaddik in the story, right? Rav Michle is not complete. He's a tzaddik in the sense that that's his job description, but his behavior here is not completely righteous because he does not demonstrate the quality of righteousness Yodea tzaddik nefesh behem to, to have a kind of awareness of the needs of his family, of his household, that someone would sell his tefillin for a whole gold dinar and spend that whole gold dinar on an etrog while there's nothing to eat that night. Well, yodea tzaddik nefesh behem to, this makes the tzaddik himself something of a, of a beast. So you understand the transformation that the story has gone uh, to modern, modern literature. In classic Hasidic tales, the, the Rebbe, the rabbi, the tzaddik is always righteous. That's how we know he's the tzaddik. Here, it's much more ambivalent. But it's not, you know, the black, the, the, what is it? Oh, well, it's kind of ironic because in other words, in, in the movies, you know, the good guys wear the white hats and the bad guys wear the black hats, except in Hasidic tales, the rabbi always wears the black garment and the black hat and the things like that. But it's not so clear black and white because he's not a complete, he's not a villain, right? He's someone who struggles. He's someone who has a human flaw and he overcomes. He overcomes by suppressing and rising above his anger, which is in many respects in, in Jewish culture, in, in, in Jewish ethical teaching, the very worst possible human trait to be angry. And therefore he redeems himself. End of story. 
But then we have the, the, the story, of course, resonates. I'm sure many of you have seen the wonderful movie that came out about uh, 16, 17 years ago, Ushpizen. Uh, you can find Ushpizen online. It's a Hebrew film with English subtitles available. And in the, in the chat, I'll post it again. Uh, in the chat, there's a link to a few clips on YouTube that particularly resonate from Agnon's story into the film. As a matter of fact, the filmmaker Shuli Rand, uh, you know, the, 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 the actor here, who's gone on to do many other things. Those of you that have been watching Stissel will know uh, Shuli Rand appeared uh, this, this past season in Stissel as Rabbi Soloveitchik. Uh, Shuli Rand uh, uh, admitted that uh, the movie kind of grew out of, out of the inspiration of, of Agnon's, Agnon's tales. And it's a story very much like our own of a man who spends a ridiculous, exorbitant amount of money on an etrog, and then the etrog uh, meets a, a bad end and his response. And you'll see just on that clip on YouTube uh, when his etrog, with which he's invested not just money, but the character has invested his own sense of self-worth. Uh, and if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. And if not, I really recommend you, you watch it uh, over the Sukkot holidays. Uh, when his etrog is chopped up and put into a salad because uh, some shlamazel uh, didn't didn't realize what it was. He thought it was a lemon, and he's eating the salad, and he realizes he's eating his his thousand shekel uh, etrog, and that he's quite literally devouring his own his own ego, his own his own not his ego, but his devouring his own sense of worth. Right? Uh, he he blah, spits it out, and he runs off into the forest, and he's pleading angry with God. You know, why are you testing me? Why are you doing this for me? What do you want from me? And then what does he say? I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be angry. And that's how the scene, almost the, the penultimate scene in the movie uh, ends. And that, of course, is taking directly from Agnon's telling of Rav Michli's story, right? I will not be angry. But the story, as Agnon tells it, has this bookend on the other side, another, uh, uh, another uh, textual uh, tra transmission tradition of how we know the story. It's a good question. You know, whenever you hear stories of the righteous, which often happen, you know, in private, which often have, here's a story that took place between, between the rabbi and his wife in their, in their room. How did this story get out? How did this story get leaked? How are we recipients of the story. In other words, within the Hasidic tradition, we're not open to the possibility that this is a literary invention. It must be true. These are tales of the righteous. But how do we know the story? Did the rabbi himself tell it? Unlikely. Did the Rebetzin herself repeat it? Probably not. Oh, now that Hasid the narrator tells us, who told me this story, said to me, I asked my Rebbe, is that really how it happened? Remember, Agnon heard the story from a chassid. The chassid heard it from Reb Shlomo the Tzaddik of Zhvil, who came to live in Israel in the, in the 20s, who was a fifth or seventh generation descendant of Rav Michle, whose, whose etrog was lost. And my Rebbe said to me, that is exactly how it happened. And my Rebbe also said to me, this story the daughter-in-law of the holy preacher, the wife of Rabbi Yosef of Yampol, told it to the father of her son-in-law, Rabbi Baruch of Mezibush. On the very day that this incident occurred, she had been in the holy preacher's home. The daughter-in-law of this couple had been there, and she was the eyewitness testimony, and she was the transmitter of the story. It's not insignificant that a story which has this kind of layer of almost mild misogyny puts a woman at front and center of being the bearer of the tradition. That causes us to go back and reread the, that misogynistic statement, ironically. On the very day that this incident occurred, she had been in the home and she had seen it with her own eyes. And when she told it years later, 
years later when her, she must have been a young bride when the story took place. And many years later, she's sitting in the sukkah with her machatenim, with her in-laws, with her, you know, meaning her, with her sons, with her sons-in-laws. And she's saying, oh, yes, I remember 40 years ago when, when I was a young bride and we were in the Magid's home for sukkahs, this story took place. And her mechutten, her, her in-law, Rabbi Baruch, the tzaddik Amezibush, said to her, mother of my daughter-in-law, tell me the story again from beginning to end. This is a story worth hearing twice. Now, this is true of all great stories. It's a story that's worth hearing twice. Agnon once famously said, any story not worth reading or any book or any story not worth reading twice probably wasn't worth reading the first time. But in Agnon's writings, it's particularly true, particularly because he's often very ironic and you don't understand the irony of the story until you reach its end. And having reached the story's end, you go back, you reread it, and you see things in the story that you hadn't picked up the first time, particularly about this, the gender dynamics in, 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 uh, in the story, particularly in not taking for granted the idea that a tzaddik, a righteous person, always gets it right. And once you realize that this is a story about a righteous person who may not have gotten it right, but who saves himself in the end, you begin to then understand how this is a much more profoundly modern story and not just a classic Hasidic tale. But it's a story that's worth telling twice because Agnon himself told it twice. You remember, Mr. Shokin used to want those stories to appear in the newspaper. This is the story that appeared on the eve of Sukkot 1948, a year earlier. Agnon had sent a different story. That story is called Ha Etrog, the Etrog. It's a different story. It's a longer story. It's a story that's set contemporaneous to when the story, almost contemporaneous to when the story is written. It's a 20th century story. It's not an 18th century story. And it's a story that takes place in Jerusalem when some of the historical characters in the story itself were, were still alive which is very curious. In English, the story appears uh, in this volume, The Outcast and Other Tales, but it's also available online. You can see it in the, in the links that I've been sharing uh, on, the, on the website. It appears on the website of Tablet Magazine, translated by yours truly. We don't have time to go into the whole story. It's, it's really uh, far too long, but you can download it and read it yourselves. This appeared in an era of Sukkot, September 1947, in the Haaretz newspaper. It features a, a character called the Rabbi of Teplik, who was a historical character, Reb Shimshon Aaron Polanski, who was the rabbi of the Beit Yisrael neighborhood of Jerusalem, uh, uh, an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood. Uh, he was known for his wisdom, he was known for his righteousness, and he was particularly known for his care of the very, very many poor residents of Jerusalem and of his neighborhood. He had come in Aliyah in 1925, just a year before Rabbi Shlomo, the Tzaddik of Zhvil, and he lived until 1948, which means that when this story was published in 47, he was still alive. The story uh, begins, the narrator, here the narrator is very clearly meant to be an autobiographical projection of Agnon into the story. He describes that he uh, wakes up the morning after Yom Kippur. Those of you in Jerusalem uh, will, will know what I'm talking about. Once upon a time, everyone went to Mea Sha'arim, to the famous old ultra-Orthodox neighborhood, to buy their Lulav and Etrog before the holiday. Today, you can buy Lulav and Etrog in every supermarket. In the country, it's a different, it's a different world. But once upon a time, even in my memory, I came, I came to live in Israel uh, 27 years ago. It used to be the day after Yom Kippur, you would go to Mea Sharim, to the, to the, to the, um, to the impromptu marketplace that was set up to sell uh, lulavim and etrogim and all the other things associated with the holiday. Very many of the old bookstores that sell that sold holy books would transform themselves from kind of dark, dingy, musty, dusty, secondhand bookstores that were, that were um, uh, whose inventory often came from indigent Jews 
who had arrived in the land of Israel with their libraries of holy books in tow and had to sell off their libraries, perhaps to support themselves, perhaps to raise a dowry, to marry off a daughter. Or when they died, their children, having distanced themselves from the traditions of their fathers and having no need for uh, for holy books, sold them off at a pittance to the moicher svarim, to the to the booksellers. And these dark, dingy, dusty, musty uh, bookshops would transform themselves for one week, and t- tables would be laid out, and the beautiful, fragrant species of the sukkah would come and enliven these. These, uh, these shops. And Agnon, the narrator, goes the morning after Yom Kippur to, to, uh, to buy himself in Etrog. Now, the way Etrogim work is that there's like kind of like basic Etrogim that costs a certain amount, and then there's better Etrogim that costs even more, and there's Eilat Davarsof. There's no end to it, to the most beautiful or expensive Etrog you can buy. And within the Jewish halacha, within the law, there is an idea that uh, the, the, the more beautiful, the better. That if you're able to add to the value of your etrog, if you're able to get a more aesthetic etrog, a more, a more, uh, a more uh, beautiful etrog, an etrog with no blemishes, uh, then that enhances the fulfillment of the commandment. He sees, Agnon says, in this bookshop, uh, uh, that Rav Polanski came in to buy an etrog. And he bought uh, a proper etrog, but not the fanciest one. And when the when the when the the esroger, a word that Agnon coins, an esroger, a seller of the esrogim of the etrogim, says to him, Rabbi, from a holy man like you, I expected you would take a more beautiful etrog. The rabbi says, Yes, but there are other needs, and we still need to have a little money to buy food to eat. And there are people in need in the community that need to be supported. So I'll buy myself the basic etrog and the rest of the money I will use for other, for other purposes. He says, not only does the etrog need to be kosher, but the money with which you purchase the etrog must be, must be kosher. As he was pacing, he passed the, uh, the next morning, on, on Sukkot morning, on the morning of the holiday, Agnon found himself in the neighborhood of this Rabbi Polanski. And he gets to the synagogue quite early. And he's waiting for the service to begin. Before the service begins, in walks this Rabbi Polanski, who he had witnessed purchasing an etrog. He was pasting, he passed the window sill where my lulav and etrog rested. He looked and asked permission to see my etrog. Upon examining it, he declared, kosher, kosher. It's proper, it's proper. I remembered him and what he had said about the officials who wasted communal funds to acquire beautiful etrogs for themselves. His exact words were, even the money to use to buy the etrog needs to be kosher. That is, kosher money is more important than adding to the beauty of the mitzvah. I asked him, Rabbi, where is your etrog? You bought a lovely etrog, and with kosher money, did you purchase it? He sat and he said, oh, in my neighborhood, there resides a certain balabos, a certain householder, tough, angry, irritable man, but he is careful about mitzvot. He bought an etrog for a half a lira, maybe more. He bragged about it in front of his neighbors, that there was none finer. I'm not sure how beautiful it really was, but there's no one in this neighborhood who can afford to buy an etrog for a half lira. During the British mandate of Palestine, the money here was linked to uh, the, the pound sterling. A half a lira was was a lot of money. It was about let's say fifty dollars in in today's forty fifty dollars in in today's in today's money, right? There are people that will spend that on an etrog today, but in that neighborhood where people were starving to death, it was outrageous. It was immoral for somebody to spend that amount of money on an etrog. So this morning, I heard a sound of crying coming from his house. I told my wife, "I hear a child's crying. Go see why she's crying." My wife said, oh, the girl was playing with the etrog that her stepfather bought for a half lira. Of course, like it's so deliciously perfect, it's a stepchild, right? In other words, it's like central casting almost. The stepdaughter of this man who bought this ridiculously expensive etrog was playing with it. It fell from her hand. It broke its pitam. It became invalid for the mitzvah. And her mother smacked her. My wife added, that poor wretch knows what's in store for her from her husband on account of her daughter from her first marriage. 
I asked my wife, where is he now? Oh, he ran to the mikveh, to the ritual bath, to immerse himself prior to performing the ritual of shaking the lulav and the etrog. If he's come out of the mikveh, he must be sitting in the sukkah of Rebbe Shlomo of Zhvil, the Zhvil at Tzadik, five or seven generation descendant of Rav Michle of our previous story. The chain, a member of the chain of, tra- tra- chain of transmission of the previous story. The rabbi who came from Zhvil and set up his Hasidic court in Jerusalem in 19. 19- 26. So our Hasid, the Hasid who spent so much money, a half a lira on an etrog, he is a disciple of none other than Rabbi Shlomo of Zhvil. And he went to observe Rabbi Shlomo as he waves the lulav. For Rabbi Shlomo's waving is like that of his father who received the tradition from his father and his father from his father back to the Magid of Zlachov the rabbi whose wife dropped the etrog in the first story. So Agnon is kind of like closing accounts with this particular Hasidic uh, dynasty. I took my etrog to the girl and I said to her, don't cry. Here's my etrog. Give it to your mother. And then he comes up with this kind of white lie. If your father or really your stepfather asks, have your mother tell him the rabbi was here and he saw that your etrog was not kosher. To enable you to perform the mitzvah properly, he gave you his etrog as an unconditional gift. Well, because of that trouble, I didn't have time to recite the blessing on my own etrog. Now, when, when, when the Rav of Taplik, when Rav Polanski tells through the daughter, the stepdaughter, tells this man who spent a half a lira on an etrog that his etrog wasn't kosher, right? It's a white lie, but it's not a white lie. An etro can become not kosher because it falls on the ground. An etro can become not kosher if it's all dried up, right? If it becomes becomes shriveled and dried up, it's not kosher. An etro can become not kosher if somebody slices it in half. An etro can become not kosher if it's stolen. There are all types of things. The Mishnah elucidates them all, things that invalidate an etro. But you know what he says? Not only does the etrog need to be kosher, but the money that you use to buy the etrog needs to be kosher. So obviously, if you steal money and you use that money to buy the etrog, it's a problem. But if you have money and you use an exorbitant amount beyond maybe what's really required in order to show off, conspicuous consumption exists even in the religious world. If you use your money when there are people that are starving, when your own household is starving, that's immoral. And that immorality attaches itself to the etrog. And that's why the etrog is pasul, he said. Now, this story, or this, this, uh, this pair of stories in Agnon's telling, uh, well, we already saw it influenced, it influenced uh, the movie Ushbizen, which is perhaps, well, maybe until Shtisel. Shtisel has become the most uh, significant Israeli export, uh, theatrically uh, speaking, uh, 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 cinema-wise or television-wise. Uh, but Ushbizen maybe is, is number two. I know people also talk about this Fauda. I don't watch all these things. The great Israeli author Chaim Be'er, for those of you who don't read Hebrew literature in the, uh, in the original, Chaim Be'er might be the most significant Israeli Israeli uh, author who you don't know because his work has not been largely has not been largely translated. But in a collection of stories of vignettes and anecdotes uh, published a couple of years back called Kesher Le'echad, he tells a story presented autobiographically, and there's no doubt that part of it is autobiographical about the great revered Jerusalem saint. Here was a tzaddik in our time, a true tzaddik. And there is no doubt about it. There is no ambivalence that Rabbi Ari Levin Zecher Tzadik Levracha was indeed a true tzaddik. Uh, he, he was, I mean, we don't have time to, uh, to even tell a fraction of the stories about the righteousness of Rabbi Ari Levin. But he tells a story about Rabbi Ari Levin that he, Chaim, Bear, the author, as a young man, he lived in Geula, the neighborhood adjacent to Mea Sharim. And in the days between 
uh, Yom Kippur and Sukkot. He goes into one of these bookshops, which has been turned into, into a, a Lulav and Etrog store. And then he says, just exactly as it's told in a story by Agnon, he sees Ribarye. Ribarye Levine comes in and there are all these people there and they have kind of like those, what are those called? The jeweler's loops, you know, those little microscopes or, 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 uh, or magnifying glasses. And they're examining, they're examining the etrog, right? For the, for the most minor, for the most minor uh, blemish. Ribarye comes in and he picks out a simple etrog, uh, hardly even looks at it, shoves it in his pocket and runs off. At the bookstore that day, my youthful brashness allowed me to ask, Reb Aryeh, don't think poorly of me for asking, but are you one of the Lamed Vovniks? Are you one of the 36 hidden saints who sustain the world? This is an ancient Jewish piece of, piece of Jewish folklore that there are hidden tzaddikim, there are hidden righteous people in whose merit the world is sustained. According to the tradition he references here, there are 36 such hidden righteous saints who sustain the world. He caressed my hand in his and asked after my mother. And then he answered my question, Alamed Vovnik, one of the 36? From time to time, mein Kind. From time to time, my child. Yes, sometimes I am one of the 36 hidden righteous. Now for the young boy, this is like the great reveal. It's This is like Clark Kent, Clark Kent telling you, Indeed, I am Superman. He placed his hand on my head and said something like the following. To be a Lamed Vovnik, to be one of the 36 righteous people in whose merit the world is sustained, is not a job. One is not appointed to the position for life. Now, remember, I mentioned earlier that the word tzaddik has two meanings. A tzaddik is somebody, everyone, everyone is, anyone who does a righteous deed is a tzaddik. Right? But tzaddik is also a job title. But Rabari says, no, no, it's not a position. It's not a, you're not appointed for life. It's more or less a temporary assignment. At the moment a person does an act of kindness, he joins the rank of the hidden 36 tzaddikim who sustain the world. But in the blink of an eye, the title is transferred when the next person does a good deed until his task is completed. Rabari shut his eyes and added, it's that simple. Anyone can be a Lamed Vovnik. You too, mein Kind. You too, my son. The bookseller, incessantly sucking on a peppermint, now presented the etrog to Rebari. Rebari thanked him, cast a quick glance at the etrog, swabbed it in its flax and wrap, and tucked it away in his coat pocket and hastened from the store. Unable to restrain myself, I ran after him. Rebari, Rebari, I must ask you something, I called out. What do you wish to ask, mein Kind? He said without breaking his stride. So Chaim asks, why does everyone painstakingly examine the etrogs with magnifying glasses for the slightest blemish? But you, Rebarie, may do with a quick peek as you ran out. Ah, Kaka, you ask a good question, my precious boy, replied Rebarie, continuing on his way. Everyone knows that there are two mitzvot the Torah requires us to beautify. One is, of course, the etrog, about which it is stated, take a fruit of the beautiful tree. If you look in the verses in Leviticus chapter 23, you'll see that the description of these four botanological species, the lulav, the etrog, the hadassim, the aravot, they're given kind of coded names, right? It's not 100% clear what they are. The etrog is called the pre eitz hadar. In modern Hebrew, eitz hadar or pre hadar is citrus fruit. Indeed, it is a citrus fruit, but that's only modern Hebrew, right? The literal meaning of the biblical text is the, the fruit of a, the beautiful fruit of a tree or the fruit of a beautiful tree. And from this, we learn out the requirement that all things being equal, a more beautiful, often connected to being more expensive, a more beautiful etrog is to be preferred. Those men were inspecting the etrogs to ensure no defect ruins their beauty and lessens the mitzvah. The other commandment of beautifying is the Hadarta Pnei Zaken, beautify the face of the elderly. That rabbinically is understood to mean you have to show respect to the elderly. You have to stand up. You have to give up your place on the bus. You have to, you have to treat the elderly with a certain amount of, of dignity. So here I have two mitzvot 
requiring me to beautify them. And I can't do both of them. I was compelled to choose which of these two commandments takes precedence. On my way to the bookshop, I stopped at the dental lab to retrieve dentures of a man from an old age, the old age home, which I had dropped off for repair on the day after Yom Kippur. By not dawdling at the bookshop, I might make it, God willing, to deliver the teeth to the man who needs them to eat his evening meal. Hopefully, he'll be able to enjoy his food like a proper human being instead of softening his bread and milk as he's been forced to do these past two days without, without dentures. Now, forgive me, I'm rushing to the number 11 bus which will arrive at any moment. I was stuck. I had these two mitzvot. Beautify the, here literally, beautify the face of the elderly. He was, the old man had no teeth in his mouth. And I have, in one pocket, I have his dentures that I just picked up from being repaired. In the other pocket, I have my etrog. So I could have spent a lot of time choosing the best etrog, right? But if I would have done that, it would have come at the cost of getting the man his teeth so he could eat his evening meal. So, you know, you have to, it's a, it's a kind of halachic triage, right? This is beyond the realm of what the religious codes indicate as the letter of the law. We have entered the realm of the spirit of the law. We have entered the realm of Jewish common sense to know what the Torah requires of us. And that was Rib Arye. So you see, Agnon has taken making explicit, Agnon, I'm sorry, Chaim Be'er, the contemporary author of this piece, has fully acknowledging the influence of Agnon on this story, tells something which he insists this story happened exactly as, it, as, as he tells it. Let's take him at his word. So even, even the reality is influenced and certainly the literature is influenced. This story existed generations before Agnon got his, got his, his hands on it. Through his pen, it's transformed from the very legitimate, I am not speaking ill, God forbid, of Hasidic tales as, a, as an authentic form of Jewish, uh, of Jewish storytelling, worthy of its own attention and study, uh, 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 full of wisdom uh, and morality to instruct us. That's not what we did here tonight. We did not examine a Hasidic tale. We examined a piece of modern literature that has its roots in the Hasidic tale, but through the work of the modern author becomes something much more subtle, much more ambiguous. Ambiguity, ambigu ambiguity of course, is the opposite of a kind of didactic teaching. In the classic Hasidic tale, you want the Hasidim to sit there and understand very clearly what the message is. In Agnon's story, you have to read it twice. Rabbi Baruch says at the end of the story, repeat the story. This is a story worth hearing twice because only when you've heard it the first time and you go back and you hear it again, do you see, oh, well, who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? It's not so clear. Right? And even the bad guy, is he bad? He's not bad. He's someone who struggles and someone who overcomes. And then in the second telling of the story, I presented them out of chronological order. The first story was published in 48. The second story was published a year earlier in 47. But that doesn't mean that that's the way in which the stories took place in the literary universe that Agnon inhabited. Perhaps the Chassid ben Chassid, the, uh, the, perhaps the, the man who tells Agnon the story was in fact the Chassid, the stepfather of the little girl who learned his lesson. And then later told the story to Agno, who chose to publish the stories out of chronological order. But then these stories go and have an impact on contemporary Israeli culture, in film, in, in, ongoing, in ongoing literature, in Ushpizen, in the work of, in the work of Chaim Be'er. And indeed, they have the ability to, to inspire us, uh, to inspire us uh, today. Uh, and therefore, I really do commend Agnon's writings. I know many of you are very familiar with Agnon's writings. I saw on the screen even some of you following along in the in the Hebrew text. In Hebrew, both of these stories appear in Agnon's collection, uh, Ha'esh Veha'etzim. Um, and if you're able to read Agnon in the original, I, I certainly do encourage that. And if if you are forced to read Agnon in uh, in translation, I certainly recommend uh, our collection that was published by the Toby Press in 15 volumes. Again, I've posted 
all of these links into the chat. Uh, some of the stories that we that we read from the clip from the film Ushbizin that particularly resonates with, or the two scenes that particularly resonate with our stories. Uh, the link to the to the Koren uh, to the Koren, to the uh, Toby Press uh, website uh, with uh, with the books, um, as well as my email, uh, which you see on the screen. I'd be happy to hear from you. Those of you in Jerusalem or near Jerusalem, or those of you that hopefully will have the chance to come back and visit us as soon as the world goes back to normal, we do invite you to come to the Agnon House in the Talpiot, in the Talpiot neighborhood. Uh, to see the very home in which Agnon sat and wrote these stories and to visit his library and, and our exhibit. And during the summer, not this past summer, not the summer before, uh, but hopefully in summer 2022, we take uh, literary tours of Eastern Europe to walk in Agnon's footsteps. Agnon and the other great Hebrew and Yiddish authors and rabbis and thinkers and teachers. And if you'd like to join us this uh, coming July, hopefully God and COVID willing for a tour of Prague, Vienna and Budapest in, in English with English guiding, uh, be in touch with us and we'd be happy to share that uh, information with you as well. I think now they open up the chat and the conversation and I think there's some questions that the moderator has gathered and I'm happy to, to answer those or to hear from you uh, offline uh, by email uh, afterwards. Thank you very much, Rabbi Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, there are many, many compliments in the chat and a few questions. Um, there were uh, a couple of questions, but since uh, it's Chag and everything, I'll just open the microphones and have people ask you themselves. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for being here from all over the world. Um, Shana Tova and Chag Sameach and Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Hello. Hi. Hi, it's Ivana from uh, Boston. I have a question for you. Could you please explain the last line? Oh, wait, this, is, this is, uh, and Carl? Is that yes. Carl? Yes, yes. Hi. <laughs> um, could you explain the last line of the story, the etro, about that's the punishment for one who is hassled? Oh, so he says, in, in other words, he, the, the, the rabbi, the rabbi uh, tells him, in other words, he comes in. Agno knows that the man has an etro because he was present when it was bought. So he says, can I borrow your etro? Can I, Mr. Agno, can I borrow your etro instead? Mm -hmm. So Agno's confused. He says, well, I know you have an etro and you bought an etro and you bought it with kosher money and I was there. So he tells him the whole story of the neighbor and how he gave up his own etro. So he says, look, I was, you know, you got, I got involved in this whole story and therefore I don't, I don't think he means it, um, Okay, let's go back to the. Uh... The language is a little confusing, at least in the English. So as he said, I think the point is that you know because I got I got uh, I got busy with this whole story, this whole this whole like we say in Hebrew, this whole balagan of this irascible, cranky uh, fellow and trying to save his his stepdaughter from getting a whack, right? So I I lost I lost my own etrog. And therefore, I wasn't able to. But it, 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 it's hard to understand. I don't get the tone of that. It sort of doesn't seem to be the summing summation that I would expect. I don't know. Uh, let me just in in in, in, he, in English it says the rabbi added that's the punishment for one who is hassled, even if he exerts himself on behalf of an etrog and purchases an etrog which is kosher according to all opinions. His haste prevents him from mm -hmm. reciting the blessing over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he got, yeah. I don't know. I don't have much to add to that. Maybe it's a translation question. I mean, right, not, unfortunately, I'm the translator yeah. in this case. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> Grab the Hebrew. The nuance of the Hebrew, maybe, I don't. In Hebrew, it says... Uh, it sounds like he's being a bit self-critical. Not this. so sure. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not yeah. sure. Hassled. <laughs> Is there another question or comment? Oh, there's Lawrence also is here. Some of the people that were involved in translating some of the stories uh, in the series are with us online. It's nice to see them. <laughs> Okay. Well, okay, thank you all very, very much for being here. Thank you, Rabbi Jeffrey Sachs. 
Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Chag Sameach. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It was great. Shana Tova. I see that there were a variety of uh, questions in the chat that I, I uh, wasn't able to look at as they were coming in. If you do, please do feel free to email me any questions and I'll try to respond. Shana Tova. Chag Sameach. Shana Tova. Oh, hello to the Weiss Brothers. My neighbors from Jerusalem. <laughs> I, it was very interesting. Was very good. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.